Hi everyone and welcome to this new session of the Global Angular Meetup. Brought to you by This Dot Media and in partnership with Angular uh, Mountain View Meetup. Uh, my name is Daniel Marin. I'm a software engineer at This Dot Labs. Uh, this Dot Labs is our main sponsor today. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at This Dot Labs or you can go to our site, uh, thisdotlabs.com and find more information about all the services and all the things, all the cool things we do with modern development. And before we continue, I want to make some announcements. We have some events coming soon. We have GraphQL plus Angular Fireside, Fireside Chat, uh, partnered with Hasura. Uh, this will be in August 11th. And then we have a global React meetup. If you're into React, uh, this is going to be on August 13th. And then we have a GraphQL Enterprise Connect, which will be partnered with PayPal and Braintree. This will be in August 14th. And if you want more information about all the events coming soon and all about our marathons and all our blog posts and everything we do, you make sure to follow us on this.media on Twitter. For today, we, we got you some really cool speakers that, well, it's gonna blow your mind with each of their talks. We have Sam Julian, we have uh, Stephen Fluent, and we have Sam Loberg. And, we have nothing much more to say. I'm going to leave it to them, which is, they are the pros. So let's get to it. So we're going to start with Sam. He's going to talk to us about the role of FEX in NGRX authentication. Then we're going to hear Sam, the other Sam <laughs> talking about Angular and technical SEO. And finally, we'll have uh, Stephen Fluing telling us about debugging the performance of five Angular apps. I suppose this is getting cut out. And well, that's it. I leave it up to you guys. Uh, according to this, you're going first, Sam. Sam Julian. Yeah, so we're uh, we're a little early. Did we want to? I guess we're we're getting getting kicked off now. But I mean, I'm good with that. Uh, oh, well, it, was, uh, it was uh it was on YouTube. It was set for twelve twenty Pacific. Oh, time. it was. Oh, okay. But I mean, I'm good with whatever. I just want to uh, make sure people are here, but. Yeah, I can definitely kick it off. Let's see. Let me share my screen. Yeah, on Meetup, it was scheduled for 10 minutes from now. No worries. So it's up to you. Do you want to do 10 minutes of witty banter? <laughs> witty banter. <laughs> That's fine. I'll... I'll uh, Please do that, because I don't know what witty banter is. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you, the other Sam and Steven from the stream as well as me. So we can leave it up to Sam. Cool. Yeah. Hi everybody. Really happy to be with you virtually today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the role of effects in NGRX authentication. So I'm a really big fan of NGRX, uh, and I love teaching other people how to use NGRX, especially people who are new to it because it's such a complicated <laughs> abstract uh, animal. And so I like bringing new people into the NGRX fold um, and the Redux pattern and all of that stuff. But one thing I've, I've noticed and some of the other folks in the NGRX ecosystem have noticed is that uh, effects Oh, sorry, hit the wrong button there. Effects are one of the hardest parts of learning NGRX. If, if you uh, talk to people who are new to NGRX, um, that seems to come up frequently that effects are sort of a stumbling block. I, and I think that's why, I think it's because even though effects are really powerful and can do a lot of things, they're really abstract. They're not concrete like actions or reducers. It's a lot easier to make that connection between like, dispatching an action and triggering uh, something in the reducer that just like seems to click for people a lot more, uh, a lot faster than effects. So effects are kind of a sticking point for folks who are new to NGRX or even have been into it for a while. Um, at the same time, um, I've been, I've given a, another talk about just sort of auth in NGRX in general. And as I've given that talk a few times, I've, I've sort of realized that effects are also kind of the main meat of authentication in NGRX. A lot of uh, authentication in NGRX basically just revolves around effects. So if you 
put those two things together, it's not you know rocket science to realize that you're t talking about effects being really complicated and also being the main part of auth in NGRX. And it can be a little nerve wracking. You can kind of have a panic attack when you start to add authentication to an NGRX app because it seems so complicated. And so what I want to do is break down this process and break down some some of the common stumbling blocks with effects to help you be relieved the next time you have to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the role of effects in NGRX auth. And first, we're going to just kind of look more broadly at effects in NGRX and kind of help you get a mental model for what effects are good for in NGRX. I call them the DJ of NGRX. You're going to get sick of that analogy by the end of this talk. And then we're going to talk about common struggles with effects, sort of three types of effects that tend for some for some reason tend to trip people up. And we're going to look at all of those, and then we're going to put them in the context of the login flow that happens when you when you have an NGRX app. So as mentioned, I'm Sam Julien, and uh, I am a developer advocate at Auth0. We're a identity as a service platform built for developers and by developers. I also love teaching. I'm an Angular GDE and collaborator. And I um, created the course Upgrading AngularJS.com, which is all about ng upgrade. And I teach for both Thinkster and Egghead. I've actually got a free Angular Basics collection up on Egghead that's, I think, over an hour long at this point. Um, I also have a website and a newsletter, samjulian.com, if you ever want to hang out and, and talk. Uh, so let's start by just talking about effects broadly in NGRX. Um, and to do that, let's have a quick architecture review. So in regular Angular, or vanilla Angular, or however you want to call it, our architecture tends to look something like this, where we have services interacting with components, and they tend to send things back and forth to each other, the services and the components. But when we get to NGRX, that's not really how our app is structured. Instead of having services and components talking directly to each other, both to and from, we have this kind of split architecture based on the Redux pattern, where application state is updated by dispatching actions to reducers, and then our components read state through selectors. And then our effects uh, listen for actions and handle side effects. So what are the roles of effects? What do effects do? So the first thing effects do is they decide when to call your services. And the other thing they do, probably the most common thing that effects do, are communicate with your APIs. So these first two tend to sync in with people faster because they start to associate, OK, I need to call my API. I need to call my backend. So I need an effect that's going to basically call the service that communicates with that API. And that's for, I think, a lot of people, that's where they stop in their understanding of effects. There's a third thing that effects do, though, and that's handle control flow logic, which is kind of a mouthful. What do I really mean by that? When we talk about control flow logic, you can think about this as a task runner. Think of effects as this task runner that's kind of the brain of your application. I like to say that NGRX effects are the DJs of the NGRX dance floor. They make sure everybody is having a good time and the music is playing in the right order and sort of overseeing the show. So let's talk about some of the common struggles that people tend to have with effects in NGRX. And again, this is just broadly with NGRX, doesn't really have anything to do with auth yet. So I find that there are three major things that people struggle with with effects. One is with when you have an action that only triggers an effect, meaning it doesn't actually touch the reducer at all to modify state. That sort of can be confusing, because it's like this action is just sort of something being dispatched and doesn't really have like a resolution in the reducer. The other thing that trips people up are non-dispatching effects, sort of a similar um, similar brain uh, mental model malfunction there, where you have a, an effect, but you're you're assuming that all effects will return an action, and then you come across one that doesn't, and that can be kind of confusing. And then the third one 
is when you come across a complex effect, you start, you, you have some idea of what you want your app to do, and you start writing an effect and you get really tripped up because you're trying to do too much at once. And you it gets really frustrating and confusing. And so usually you just sort of throw your hands up and walk away until tomorrow. So it turns out that for authentication in NGRX, we actually have all of these things. <laughs> we have actions that only trigger effects. We have non-dispatching effects. And we have complex effects. So let's try to figure that out. In order to kind of walk through that and think through some strategies on these struggles with NGRX effects, let's look at the login flow in general in NGRX and then kind of break it down piece by piece. So when we look at authentication in most single page applications, it tends to look something like this, where you have uh, a login that gets kicked off usually by clicking a button or maybe the application loads and you get uh, sent over to a provider where you need to log in. It could be your own uh, provider. It could be a service like Auth0 or AWS Cognito or something else. And then you get sent back to the application and you got to do something uh, to, to process that redirect. Usually you have to process the response or interact with an SDK or something and process a success and error. And then inside of that success is where you get your user information and your token that you'll send back to your API. And you'll also typically redirect the user somewhere else. And, and in that success response might even be the, um, the URL that you need to redirect them to. So in vanilla Angular, what we typically do is we do most of this in the auth service itself. We just sort of dump everything into the auth service. We store the token in the user there. We interact with whatever auth SDK we're doing. And we handle all of the redirect logic. And that's because we have our service and component architecture that we mentioned earlier, where they're talking to each other in two-way communication. And typically, what happens is you're, you've got your data services and your auth service. And maybe you have an interceptor in there that adds the token to your outgoing requests. And the three, these three pieces of the puzzle are all interacting with each other. But again, NGRX isn't really set up that way. And so instead of having an architecture like this, where we have our services and components interacting with each other, we have this spread out architecture again, with, which is based on Redux. And so what ends up happening is that the auth service becomes this thin layer alongside of our effects. And all the other responsibilities get divided up among the selectors and the components and the reducers and all of that. So let's look at that flow again. And this time, I have a little bit of a challenge for you. I want, to, I want you to think about which parts of this auth flow are directly changing state. So let's look at it again. So we start the login process by logging into a provider. We get sent over to a provider to log in, and then we uh, get sent back over to handle a redirect. Then we process that redirect by interacting with an SDK. And if we get a success back, then we have a user and a token, and then we send the uh, user on their way to wh whatever part of the site they were trying to access. So if we think about which piece, which which of these this entire process is based on changing state, the only things that we're keeping in state are the user and the token. Out of this entire long ordeal, we're just getting the user and the token in state. And so we'll have our, our state, and we'll have user profile, and we'll have the access token. Everything else in this entire process is a side effect. And so everything else in this process needs effects to run properly. So. Let's break this down a little bit more and just take it one step at a time, or half. let's do half at a time. So let's just look at the, the first part of logging into the provider, basically kicking off the login process. We would typically have a, an action that we would create to just kick off the login process. And then we would have an effect where we would have this login effect, and we would listen for the login action. And then we would call the auth services login method. And we're only using the tap method here uh, because we're not dispatching a new action. And that login method that we're calling, if we kind of zoom into that, is here on the auth service. And you'll notice that this login method is really just uh, kind of wrapping around the SDK. 
let's go back and we have our tap because we're not returning a new action. And because we're not returning a new action, we need to add this options object and um, set a, an option called dispatch to false. So it basically tells NGRX, hey, this effect is not dispatching a new action. So we've already encountered uh, two things. We've already encountered an action that only triggers an effect. You notice that we didn't change any state with our login. And we've encountered a non-dispatching effect because what's happening here is we click that login and it sends us to a completely different place. And so what helps in this situation is to remember that effects, one of their primary functions is as a task runner. They don't need to be tied directly to actions. Effects are the DJ of the NGRX dance floor. I said that already, but what did I really mean by that? Well, if you are uh, at some party with a DJ, uh, nothing happens when you say like, hey, DJ, play my favorite song, unless the DJ just starts like instantly serenading you on the spot. There's 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 a process that has to happen to actually make that happen. Right. So the DJ has to grab a record and put it on the record player and then play the song. And so if we try to kind of think of this in terms of NGRX or, or side effects and state. These first two things are just side effects, right? The only thing that's changing the state is actually playing the song on the record player. And so we can think of the same thing with our app. When we say, hey, app, log me in, uh, nothing happens immediately. There's got to be some steps that lead up to that process. We've got to call the auth service to log in, and then we've got to handle that entire redirect flow that we mentioned, and then we update the store. So if you think about that, all of those other things are just side effects until we actually update the store to change our state. So that's the first half. Let's talk about the second half of handling the redirect and processing our success and our error. This is where we're going to get our user and our token, and then we're going to send the user on their merry way. So to start working this into our app, we'd probably create an action for handling the redirect. And then we'd have an effect for handling the redirect that would listen for that handle redirect action. And then inside of our RxJS operator here, and we're using exhaust map just in this example, but what do we do in this? Like, How do we get all these things to happen all at once? There's a lot that happens here. So we might take a stab at it, make an attempt at it, and we've got our handle redirect uh, method on our auth service that we're going to call here with a pipe. and this is where we're going to call the SDK to go get all the stuff, to get, a, get the token and the user uh, and the URL that we need to send the user to. And then with that response, this is where it starts to get kind of confusing. Like, what are we really supposed to do here? We know we got to do something, and we know that we've got to handle a, an error. We've got kind of a handle redirect failure thing. But this middle part, things start to get murky. We know we need to set the user and token somewhere, but is it here or is it somewhere else? And we know that we need to navigate to the redirect URL. But again, where do we do that? And then we're assuming that we need to dispatch some sort of success action. But it's all just sort of a jumbled mess. And it's hard to work through this. And this is exactly what I mean by encountering a complex effect. This is where things you start to write an effect, and you just kind of get in the weeds and, and fall off the track. And so I want to show you kind of a strategy that I use to back up and get out of this situation. And usually what I find is that somewhere along the way, I've taken something for granted. And I need to play this game of finding the hidden side effect. What did I do that is actually two steps that I've sort of merged into one? And if we look at this, handling the redirect and then processing the success for everything, it helps to break the effect into smaller pieces. Because if we look at this, Processing the user and the token is actually already a side effect. And then redirecting the user is another side effect. So one thing that's important to know about effects is that what you want to do is, as best you can, let one effect handle one side effect. When I was first building out this talk and I ran this by Mike Ryan, he said that this would, if he, if he was ever going to give a talk on uh, good effect hygiene, this would be one of the tenets of good effect hygiene. So if we go back and look at our login flow again, and like we did for the initial login, 
uh, where we have our redirects flow, the first thing we need to do is we need to call the auth service to process our response from the SDK. Then we need to update the store with the user and the token. And then finally, we need to redirect the user. So the first and the third parts of this are side effects. And then the second part is where we're actually updating the store. And so this helps us because we can go back to our effect here and we can do some refactoring. We know we're going to call the SDK here. And in this middle part, we can rearrange some of this. What we're going to do is instead of trying to do too much in this one effect, we're going to dispatch a new handle redirect success action that's going to have the payload, which will include our token and our user, and then also the redirect URL. And then we can go back to the reducer and add a case for handle redirect success. And in here, once it hears of the uh, once that handle redirect success action is dispatched, then we're going to update our state by st putting our token and our user on there. And now we can create a new effect that listens for that handle redirect success effect that we just created, or the action that we just created. So we have handle redirect success. The, the effect it listens for this action, and it's going to receive that redirect URL and can uh, use the router to programmatically navigate the user to that redirect URL. And again, we're using tap here because we're not returning a new um, action to dispatch. And so since we're doing that, we need that same options object with the dispatch option set to false. So that's we, we've successfully navigated all three of these, actions that only trigger effects, non-dispatching effects, and complex effects in NGRX. But I know that's a lot of information to digest, so let's do a quick review of kind of the highlights here. So we talked at the beginning of the talk that effects are one of the hardest parts of learning NGRX probably because they are kind of abstract and they, they serve a few different purposes. But they're also a really big part of implementing auth in NGRX. And so they're important. And uh, auth is already a complex subject, so it can get kind of hairy. So in Angular, what we normally do is we have our services and our components talking to each other. And we would have maybe uh, an interceptor that adds the, the, the token from the auth service into the data services to call APIs, and everything would be interacting with each other. But in NGRX, we don't do that. We have this uh, more distributed architecture, if you will, where uh, the auth service is sort of this thin layer above the effects. We also talked about how effects have three primary purposes. They decide when to call services. They com communicate with APIs and they handle control flow logic. And we talked about how handling control flow logic is just kind of a fancy way of saying they're a task runner or that they are the DJs of the NGRX dance floor. We also talked about the three main struggles that people tend to have with effects, actions that only trigger effects, non-dispatching effects, and complex effects, and how coincidentally, all three of these are part of the authentication process. So we looked how, at how in the first half of the login process, we get both of these. We get actions that only trigger effects and non-dispatching effects. And to help with that, it helps to remember that effects are a task runner. And if we write out the sequence of events, we can a little bit easy, more easily distinguish between what's an effect and what's um, changing the state of our application. And then in the second half of the login process, we realized that we were encountering a situation of a complex effect. And what helps here is to kind of back up and think about if there's something you've missed, if you're taking an effect for granted, find the hidden side effect, and then break the complex effect into smaller pieces. We always want to let one effect handle one side effect. So if we need to create new actions or new effects or new cases in the reducer, that's totally normal and acceptable. So in that redirect flow, half of the process, we figured out that calling the service to process it and update and redirecting the user were our side effects. And updating the store, of course, was changing the state of our application. And so we were able to work through each one of these and uh, get some strategies here. And again, this these kinds of things aren't just for authentication. This should help you with any NGRX app. So hopefully, we've taken you from hyperventilating when you think about effects in NGRX authentication to feeling some relief. So 
Uh, these slides, I gave a version of this talk at ng-conf hardwired, so the slides are up at ng-conf hardwired. You can also always just follow me on Twitter and ask me questions. I tend to be pretty responsive about things. I do my best, and I love helping the community and, and uh, pointing people in the right direction. So thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. That was awesome. Uh, let's see if we got some questions. Do you want to? I think we don't have actually questions. Just this one. So you can, if you want to, you can give an answer to that one. Yeah. So they're not just for calling APIs. They're also for um, handling any sort of control flow logic or or running any sort of task. So it's sort of like if you if you think of actions like like triggers for events, then effects are listening for those those events and then responding to them. So that could be something like opening and closing a modal, like for uh, confirmation. It could really be anything. Um, APIs are just sort of the most um, common use for effects. We got another one that I don't know if you have time to go into detail. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a great resource for that, actually, which is a talk that me and Mike Ryan gave last year at RxJS Live. Uh, let me find, do to do I have, should have a link right here. Uh, well, we can paste it into the chat afterwards, but in that talk we go over, it was really a talk about the group by operator, but in the first, like, half of the talk, we go over the difference between merge map, concrete map, and uh, our concrete map, <laughs> a concat map. And uh, I'm in the middle of buying a house, so my brain is in uh, a <laughs> really, uh, really weird space right now. Um, let me find it. I've got it. Right. That group by talk is really awesome. That blew my mind. It was, the animation um, that you guys created to show how, you know, everything, how the pipe worked and all the events, the stream, it was really nice. Yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm really talking about fun. that. It was a really so fun talk. Everyone to hearing us, I'm going to share the link here in the comments so you can go ahead and see the talk that um, Sam is recommending. Oh, great. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. So thank you, Sam. I'm going to, I'm going to take you out of stage so we can bring Sam now and we'll talk in a minute. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, Sam. Hi. Hey. Are you ready? I am ready. Just sharing my screen. I have a question for you. How how should I pronounce your, your last name? I, I tried to say Blobert, but then I, I use yeah, Google it's, Translate and in Dutch it's so much different the the pronunciation. So I was Yeah, wondering. so you pronounce it Vluberics. Vluverks. Try it. Try it. Vluverks, right? Ah, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Ah, uh, see, I'm, I'm almost there with my Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm ready. So you're so, there. I'm out. Thank Good you. Luck. So hi, everybody. Welcome, and thanks for joining my talk today on Angular and Technical SEO. Thanks a lot to this dot for the invitation and the organization of this online broadcast. So. Let me start with a short story. Uh, so imagine you're coding, you're coding like a ninja, and you've been working on, on this big project for a long time together with an awesome team. And finally, the end is near and a big release is coming. But suddenly, a wild SEO expert working on your project appears. Well, it should have appeared much earlier, by the way, but somewhere in the project's early phases. But yeah, let's not talk about project management today. He basically tells you that your application, it's working super nice, works really well, so good job. But the previews, when sharing on social media, for example, they look very weird. And most of the contents of the application cannot be found on search engines like uh, Google or Bing. So that's quite a bummer, uh, and we should have thought about this much earlier. So the big thing for today is, how can we as Angular developers help our SEO experts to reach their goals on our application? Let's find the answers. So there are plenty of things that we can do uh, to boost or even break down the uh, search engine optimization goals of, of our websites and applications. But for today, let's focus on five things that we as Angular developers and architects can do to, 
to help reach the goals of the SEO experts. The first and most low level thing to do is uh, we can write proper uh, semantic HTML and we can try to adhere to a low text code ratio. We can provide functionality to dynamically update title, meta tags, and other relevant and important tags. We can implement features to enable rich search results uh, by, for example, using RDFA, microdata, or JSON linked data. And we can enable perfect crawling accessibility, which is a crucial part for search engine optimization. And in general, if we can provide a great experience to our users, we are doing a good job. But first, uh, some remarks up front. All of these concepts will be explained on a very high level, and they are mostly intended to give you a head start when you start researching for yourself. So if you have a specific and perhaps a detailed question about any of these concepts, uh, please feel free to, to ask them in the chat. Who am I? My name is Sam. I'm a freelance software engineer. I'm also the co-organizer of the Belgian Angular Conference, NGBE, and the Angular Belgium Meetup Group. I am very happy to serve the Angular community as a GDE. And if you want to know more about me, feel free to check my website. So the first concept, uh, the semantic HTML, it's important because proper usage of HTML code will give meaning to the text content that is on your page. So for example, a very basic example, when we use H1, H2, I think we lost Sam for a second. Uh, yeah, Sam, I brought you in too, so I can check that it's not me. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, yeah he yeah, dropped right. off for a sec. So I was yeah. at H1, H2 till H6, I think. So it's important that we use these tags because then our browser will know that it's a title. But for example, also search engines and other crawlers or perhaps screen readers will know how to handle the, the, that piece of information on our page. Same is true for other elements like lists or images or forms or figures with a caption. The question that you should always ask yourself when coding is, what elements best describe or represent the data that I'm going to populate in my HTML code? So if you're not sure, then you should take a deep dive into what semantic HTML is, or if you don't have the time or, or or somebody else uh, needs to do it, or perhaps you can ask your favorite uh, SEO expert. He should be able to help you out and provide you with more instructions. Well, semantics cannot only be applied on HTML, but they can also be applied on other code like JavaScript or uh, CSS. This is not very important for SEO, but I just wanted to mention it, that for example, in CSS, when you uh, consider styling a list with list items, representing, for example, different types of fruits, would it be easier for you to know which part of the DOM is being selected when you use diff ul li, or would it be easier if you use the class just named fruits item? The same in JavaScript, where you consider a function, takes a string parameter, returns a list item, with that string as a text content, would it be easier for you to, to take a look at the code to understand what the function did if it was called build, or if it was called create list item with content? It's, it's something to think about because it's just about being descriptive and giving meaning to your code. So in, in the modern, day, modern days development, you should not worry about giving long names to your variables or function names because that code will get minified anyway. Uh, there's a great resource on semantics on the web on the Mozilla Developer Network, which I also took my examples from, so check it out. Another thing, uh, so when normally when so normally all the text content on your page can be uh, surrounded by, a pro by the appropriate HTML tag, with, which has a semantic value. Uh, this will guard us from overusing, for example, uh, a lot of divs and spans. And this kind of disease, it's called divitis and, or spanitis. It has been described for many years already, and it's very common and widespread all over the internet. Uh, for example, if you find many divs wrapped in another, but without a very clear reason, you could probably think about refactoring it. There is always a, almost always a very logical refactor possible. 
But if you are, for example, doing fancy uh, position tricks or having special mark markup, uh, you might require a lot of diffs, but you should always assess your case very carefully. Also, when you use proper semantic HTML, your text to code ratio might drop, meaning that we will need less bytes of HTML tags compared to the amount of bytes representing actual text content. And this ratio will indicate search engines that the page contains a decent amount of text uh, that is that should be indexed, uh, which is very, very important for the user. So when we compare the two options from our previous example, we can clearly see that the, ama the amount of HTML tags uh, is much less if we use the proper semantic HTML tags. So again, if you're unsure about how to achieve this, uh, for your specific case, you should get in touch with your favorite SEO expert. Uh, this is another very basic example, but it's a typical code snippet that I see uh, coming out of code reviews. Um, and it's because we, we can't use more than one structural directive on an element. Uh, so the ng if will get applied on the div surrounding the element that has the ng4 applied. And this will add a surrounding div if in this code example, the feature is enabled. But by, for example, using ng container, we can avoid adding this extra code uh, to our API. HTML. So surrounding the content with ng, uh, ng container and the condition, this will not result in extra HTML code. The next topic, uh, title, meta, and other tags on our pages. This is very important for SEO, but also for the sharing capabilities of your application on uh, social networks. So in most cases, the actual title of your page will be used in, search, in the search results of search engines. So your application should be able to set a unique title for each page. Uh, and next to that, um, many, and if not all social media platforms allow you to share content on your feed. So if you want the platform to generate a preview of the URL that you're sharing, that page needs to implement uh, the correct meta tags for those specific platforms. So what you see here, is the required code to make everything work properly for the title on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So the title and meta service provided by Angular are very easy to use helper service for this. So what you should take away from this code example is that each platform or different platforms might expect different implementation, impl implementations and rules on how you should uh, name those meta tags. Uh, the properties that you should give them. So for example, Twitter requires a meta tag with a name attribute and a specific Twitter prefix value. But Facebook is following the open graph protocol and it requires the property attribute name with the OG prefixed value. Some, some other platforms like for example, LinkedIn, uh, they are also following the open graph protocol, but each social media network uh, could implement its own requirement. So you should always check for your own need for your own project. There are some other important tags uh, that could be implemented in the page for SEO purposes. And one of them is the, well, one of them is the canonical link. And the canonical link denotes the, the single source of truth of the loaded content. And other important tags are uh, for example, for potential alternative pages, like alternative languages of the content that is loaded. And these are two of the most significant examples. Uh, setting these specific elements in the head can be achieved by uh, using the document uh, utility service that wraps around the document global object, and it exposes uh, the API of the document. So, the title and meta services plus the document should be enough to implement all these uh, specific technical requirements. To achieve this, we have several community plugins available that will do the job for you if you implement them correctly. Uh, if you just search on uh, Angular SEO on NPM, you will find plenty, plenty of relevant packages. And you might find NGX SEO, which is a library that I made, but in, in many cases, you will probably want to build your own library because your logic will depend on the needs for your specific project. 
So please take a look at the so source code, which is, as usual, open source code, um, to set up your own version of, of the implementation. Then, you might already have seen these kind of uh, rich search results uh, in the Google search. And these snippets of extra relevant data to the search results are provided by structured data that is added on top of all the normal text content that we extract from uh, the pages. So for the first result uh, that you see here, uh, we get a related list of frequently asked questions. And the search result on Google will allow you to, to open up the uh, questions and, and show the answers. And on the second result, we get a rating score and the price range of an hotel that is part of your search results. How do we achieve this? Uh, well, there are three potential ways of adding this, this structured data. The first one is RDFA, which is short for a very long name, Resource Description Framework in Attributes. Uh, and this is an official uh, W3C recommendation. And you can use this to set structured data using attributes on elements in any XML-based markup language, like, for example, HTML. And the second, microdata, is basically just an alternative to RDFA, and it's quite similar. Uh, the difference here is that you can only use it on HTML code. And the last, uh, definitely not least, is uh, json link data, which is the more modern, uh, pure data-driven and recommended approach by Google. The, and this structured data can be outputted as JSON compared to adding all the specific fields to the attributes of uh, each relevant HTML element, which means a lot more coding and maintenance work, as you will see. And the thing to remember here is that in the end, they all provide the same result because they're all based on a specific scheme defined in some library of schemes. And as an example, schema.org is, is one of those libraries. And as, as far as I know, it's the most widely adopted. Uh, at least it's the one that I mostly use uh, when I do this kind of projects. And this library, for example, describes uh, an entity named person. And it provides also good examples on how to build the markup or data structures that will enrich your code. So for as an example, let's take the example of George Bush, uh, former president of the USA. And I've taken this example because it's one, it's one of the examples shown on the website. So you can easily find it. And this is just a simple description of who he was. And we will show uh, the example implementation of this uh, public person using RDFA, microdata, and JSON-LD. So the first example is the RDFA example. And to enable this in your Angular templates, you only need to add the specific attributes that you see here to your HTML code. There's nothing more to it. Same for uh, microdata. It's just the attributes and the values of the attributes that are different. And no, the values are the same, actually. So to enable it in your Angular templates, you only need to uh, add those specific attributes. As an example implementation, you see it's actually it's it's no difference from from a normal implementation. You just add more metadata to your HTML. And then the JSON LD example, this will probably be a little bit more appealing to you as a developer because in fact you just need to serialize a JSON object into your HTML and bam, you're done. And the backend or CMS could be responsible for generating this structure. And you, as a front-end developer, just have to fetch it and print it out. But how do we get this uh, snippet output in our code? Uh, there, as far as I know, there is no service for that provided by Angular. But it's really no rocket science to code this ourselves. Let take, let's take a look. So this is a very basic implementation of a service that will get you started outputting JSON link data in your pages. So you only the service only requires you to have the object with the data available. And it's up to you to implement your own business logic to get this data. So the code is also heavily based on, on the example for setting the canonical URL, uh, as you can see. 
So we just have a function, a helper function, set data, which takes the JSON-LD object or an array of JSON-LD objects. And it injects the data by first checking, checking if there was already a script container available and then updating or inserting the data into the document set. And that's it, very simple. Then the most important enabler for search engine optimization is probably crawl accessibility. So if you don't do anything fancy with your static server setup, uh, for example, by using a robot.txt file, or perhaps by blocking search engines uh, from indexing your application using some headers, crawlers should always see a result coming from your server that looks like the screenshot on the left. And this is basically the auto-generated index HTML that will get served for every route of your Angular application, but it does not contain any content. And why is that? Because typically the browser is responsible for generating and building up the pages with uh, JavaScript, which means that they are client-side rendered. And while some crawlers, like for example, the new and updated evergreen Google bots, uh, are able to render the full pages to some extent, many others are not, and they require a little bit of help. And for them, we need to enable server-side rendering or pre-rendering of our applications. And for doing that, there, well, there are currently two notable options for server-side and for pre-rendering of Angular applications, which are Angular, Universal, and Scully. And Universal will enable server-side rendering and pre-rendering of your application. And from, from my experience, it's best used with highly uh, changing and dynamic content. Uh, and when your application has a lot of dynamic pages, with a lot, I mean uh, in the order of 10,000 and more, but you can also use them, of course, with a low amount of pages. Uh, but Universal does require some strict coding principles, but the benefit of that is that it, the result is really, really fast. Scully uh, enables pre-rendering, but it's not really fitted uh, for server-side rendering. So the upside is that it can be used with any uh, Angular application using any third-party libraries. And the related downside to that is that it can be relatively slow uh, when you are rendering the pages. In my experience, Scully is best used for uh, not too often changing content uh, and also with a limited amount of pages because every time that the content of the pages changes, you need to rebuild it and redeploy it to your static web server. If you want to know more and read more about Scully or Universal Choice, uh, I've written quite a lot about Scully, uh, Universal, which one to pick, uh, and other SEO-related topics for Angular. And I do a deep dive on most of the important differences. So if you want to read more, feel free to check them out. Then one more uh, tip to end the presentation, and it's, it's, uh, it's one that I learned the very hard way. And that is when, when you're doing server-side rendering or pre-rendering, you might be tempted to minify the HTML output of, of the rendering. And this is a good thing eh? because it will save your visitors even more bytes when they load your pages, which in its turn, it's, it's again good for SEO. But be careful, don't over minify your output because not all crawlers are as smart in understanding the output. For example, the browser might understand it when you like very uh, detail, detailed minify your HTML because a browser is very forgiving and it will fix it for you. But other clients require a very strict and full HTML tree uh, to be able to parse all uh, the content and the HTML. So for example, as you can see here, um, this is the example of the LinkedIn post inspector. I checked my own homepage uh, already some, some years ago, and LinkedIn was not able to find the meta tags in my HTML output. And why? There was a vital piece of code missing in the source code. And that missing piece of code was the head tag. And why is that? Because I used a too strict set of HTML minification options uh, which included the settings to remove all the attribute quotes and the optional tags. 
And the head tag is also an optional tag for a browser, but a more basic browser, like the one that LinkedIn here is using, is requiring it. It expects that the HTML tags are located directly inside a head tag, which in this case is removed by the minifier. So a very simple fix is to disable the removal of the attribute codes and the optional tags by the HTML minifier. And then it all works as expected. To validate all of this, we fortunately have a lot and plenty of tools available uh, to validate the, the HTML output. And nearly every big player or social media network, Google, Bing, uh, others have, have tools to validate and even burst the cache of your pages uh, of your application. So you can, what you see here is for me, the most important validator tools that I use for my projects. But again, please check your own needs because you might need to support others like Bing, Baidu, perhaps even Yahoo. So if you get all those four things right, you have started with a very good recipe for a great user experience. But like with all recipes and, and the meals that come out from those recipes, we, we can still add extra spices and herbs to make it perfect. So remember that these are just the basics. Uh, just remember, if your pages, pages are fast, they're low on memory consumption and bandwidth, and especially on mobile, your users and your search engines will be happy. So thank you very much for your attention. As I said before, please feel free to contact me via email or directly on Twitter if you have any related questions. And I will also be very happy to answer some questions if I have the time now. Thank you. Sam, uh, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. It's it, Actually, it's been a while since I've been looking like this kind of content about SEO with Angular. I think it's quite interesting, all the research and the work you've done. Uh, and thank, thank you for your time. Um, are you ready, Steven? Uh, I'm gonna take you out of stage for a second, Sam, and we'll see you in a minute. Hey there, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go as always. Cool, so I leave it up to you. Do you have something to share or? Yeah, so let's talk about that as a group here. So uh, I have a presentation prepared about uh, debugging the performance of Angular apps and kind of the statistics I've seen across the board. Uh, but I want to actually ask everyone that's watching live right now, uh, would you rather I talk about the roadmap? Because Sam was like, please talk about the roadmap. <laughs> he said, are you going to talk about the roadmap? And I was like, no. But I, I really do like this idea of like, if everyone wants me to talk about the roadmap, let's talk about the roadmap. <laughs> We're working on my special effects. It's, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. to sort of Online meetups. All right, yeah, so, so let's look at the chat. The I'm the performance or there. So if, if no one comes in on the chat, then we'll just let Sam, the Sam's vote. <laughs> All right. So we've got two votes for roadmap. Sam's, are you on board to, to grill me about the roadmap? I think that would be fun. Yeah. It's like if it's okay for you guys, I'm not going to stay too long because it's very warm in here and it's already very late here in Belgium as well. So, well, not that late, but late for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That so I'm going to stay five or ten more minutes and then I'll probably go. Yeah, Sounds I'll probably, I'll probably about another 20, 20 minutes. 27 minutes anyway. So let's just mm -hmm. dive in then. I'm going to share my screen. First, I'm going to close the window because they're doing the landscaping outside. All right, we're doing this live. So you can tell, isn't it fun? All right, so we should be able to see my screen here momentarily. All right, here's the presentation I was going to give, but we're not gonna give that one. Instead, we're gonna dive directly into the roadmap. So uh, if you didn't see, yesterday, Jules uh, and the team, we posted this blog post all about, we really wanna share more. And we've actually been working on this for months uh, in order to kind of figure out what our roadmap should be, where we're going after, uh, version nine and version 10 came out. Uh, and so we started to share the first sets of kind of information from that effort with the world. And so we have on this uh, Angular IO website, this very nice page called Roadmap now. And so there's a couple ways we can do this. I can either just go through them one by one and explain them a little bit and talk about the, the background and the ideas there, or we can just kind of name them and then 
someone can just grill me on it and say, hey, Steven, what on earth are you doing with TypeScript 4.0? Why would you do that? Stop doing that. How do you want to do it? Sure, whatever. I, I think you should just start by going through what you want to cover. All right, I, I will just go through one by one then. All right, so uh, first up here, we have Operation Bye Bye Backlog, <laughs> which is a, a really fun name. Uh, our operation bylog. Uh, we are really doing this this big effort on the team to pay more attention to the community. We actually did this visioning exercise earlier in the year, and one of the things that came out of it was that all of the team wants to spend more time listening to users and doing things that users care about. And so, one of the ways that we can do that is actually investing uh, more time and energy into keeping up on our GitHub issue count, PR count, those sorts of things. And so the way that we're doing this is we're doing it in a couple passes. First, we're going to go through and we've been triaging. So I think that triage process is actually done in the components repo and done in the tooling repo. And we're almost done in the Angular Angular repo. But what we're, we're doing is we're really trying to make sure that we've looked at everything. We have asked for repos if we don't have them, make sure that the issues are actually actionable. And then really the kind of idea there is let's look for not just individual issues that we can fix or problems we can solve, but let's look for the overall concerns and the categories of problems that people are focusing on so that as we start to get into fixing these, then we can actually go and fix multiple issues at the same time. We've actually already seen this on the tooling team where they, they finished the triage and then they, they found a bunch of kind of categories of issues where they can go and fix a whole bunch of issues at the same time uh, by changing some of the behavior just a little bit. So. This is actually, I'm really, really excited. Like the the words here, 50% of our engineering capacity, that is a huge, huge commitment from the Angular team. Yeah, indeed. And after that, the 20% also, it's very, it's, it's still huge. 20% <laughs> of the capacity, nice. Yeah, no, I mean, this, this is intended to make sure that like, we're never going to get down to zero issues. I think the goal should not be zero issues or zero mm -hmm. PRs, but the, the goal should be to be current so that the issues that are there are reflective of work that we think we should do, that bugs that are actually in the product and are hurting people, um, and that PRs are dealt with in a timely manner because the, the longer a PR sits, the less valuable it becomes for anybody and the, the more work it is to get it back up to date. And so uh, I think if we can do this successfully and just get to a steady state where we, we have a number of issues, um, I actually, one of the things I do is I look at a bunch of other repositories and you'll see uh, some GitHub repositories, they try and hover around like 500 issues. Some repositories, they're like, eh, 4,000 issues isn't a problem. So <laughs> open source projects do this. There, there's like no standard across the board for open source projects. All right. Uh, and if you, if you have questions around the roadmap, feel free to put them in the chat too. I'm happy to, to respond to questions there as well. All right, next up, support TypeScript 4.0. Angular has always kind of committed this idea that we're not going to be left behind by the ecosystem. And so part of that effort is that anytime someone else ships one of our dependencies ships an update, we have to go figure out what does this mean? How do we migrate people? How do we keep the code working? Um, the, the good thing is that TypeScript keeps getting better and better at throwing in things like, oh, you can optionally turn this on. Um, so that helps as well as they really, like they're in a level or a stage of their development where the changes they make in 2020 or 2021 are probably going to be less disruptive than the changes they made in 2020 and the same thing in 2019. What we've seen most of the time is that when this hits developers, it's because they had bugs in their code that were wrong, like technically wrong, but the TypeScript compiler wasn't able to catch it. And so that's actually one of the biggest challenges to, to staying up to date with Angular. It's not even the Angular releases, it's just the TypeScript releases. Um, but you can always turn off some of those strictness if, if that's a problem for you. Uh, update our end-to-end -end testing strategy. So uh, to ensure we provide a future-proof end-to-end testing strategy, we want to evaluate the state of protractor community innovations and best practices and explore novel opportunities. So mm -hmm. the way that I think about this is that protractor is good, right? It is still the recommended strategy from the Angular team, but we've also worked hard over the last couple of years to make sure that you don't have to use protractor if you don't want to, right? That you can pop in things like Cypress or Jest, and there, there's really great schematics out there. Um, or you can use kind of different strategies. Like what if you wanted to use Puppeteer to do your end-to-end -end testing? And so each of these strategies has drawbacks. Like there are certain amounts of accessibility that you cannot test in within the browser in like the Jest or the Cypress layer. So how do you write those kinds of tests? Is it now like a hybrid model where you can do both Protractor and something else, which seems worse? Um, and so really just kind of looking at the community, looking at the best practices out there and trying to figure out where, where should we push the community um, because there's there's a lot of good answers, and so we're trying to figure out, okay, 
what is the good answer going to be for the next 5, 10, 15 years? Um, and also kind of holding ourselves to this idea that we should plan for the long term and not just be limited by what we have today and really think, okay, where, where should we be headed together? Sam's thoughts? Well, I saw some comments on Twitter about this and many people are asking like, oh, is, is Cypress gonna replace Protractor? Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think this is a, a short term or even a long term goal, right? It's yeah, no. So, so the I mean, the answer here, like, is we don't know. Um, yeah. I would guess that Cypress is not going to replace Protractor as one to one, because um, as I said, like, there are some things that Cypress today can't test in terms of mm -hmm. like emulating accessibility features. Um, but in my head, at least, and, and again, we're going to figure this out as a team. So I'm, I'm speaking out of turn, and I'm only speaking on behalf of myself. I think that Cypress is a hugely valuable way of running integration tests for folks. Uh, and so I would love to see a solution where if you want to use Cypress, you can use Cypress, and it, it pops in very easily, and it, it solves problems for you. One thing that would be super helpful on this roadmap for Protractor would be um, evaluating the hybrid state of having having a hybrid app with both angular js and angular right now it's a really big blocker for people who are upgrading if they have uh, a lot of protractor tests it's almost it's almost impossible <laughs> just because there's this bug where the uh, the zone the zone detection and the and the digest cycle get out of sync with each other and so I've seen a lot of companies with a lot of protractor tests in Angular JS basically have to stop migrating for that. So that would be something that'd be awesome to look into. It, it sounds possible. like something that there's already an issue for. Uh, you should there is an that. issue. There is a, a famous issue for it at this point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. If you want to just, I don't know, look up what the issue number is, we can kind of follow up on that and make sure that that's considered as sure, part of yeah. it. I think it's it's fundamentally yeah, a hard yeah. problem because. The digest cycle and zones are going to fight if you don't integrate them with the, the right kind of uh, organization. And there are certain things you just can't do with those two things running. So the yeah. options are off zones or like separate the AngularJS parts, which so it, it is not a, a straightforward answer. Like if, yeah. if you could just send a PR, we would love you to just send a PR, but I don't think it's, <laughs> oh, it's easy. And I'm sure it's I'm sure it's an easy fix for anybody. <laughs> Awesome. Um, all right, I'm going to take a look at the YouTube comments here. Uh, there's been the long been the idea of renaming Angular Flex Layout to Angular Layout since it supports both Flexbox and CSS Grid and promote it better. Uh, please consider. Uh, yes, we should consider that. Uh, I think it does have features that that are not captured by the idea of Flex Layout. So thank you for for pointing that out. Uh, all right. I'll just continue down the list here in the, the remaining kind of five minutes. Maybe we'll hit a couple more of these. Uh, evaluate future RxJS changes. So this is actually a reflection of, uh, similar to the TypeScript one, where we want to stay up to date with the ecosystem. There is RxJS version 7 in beta right now. It's got some breaking changes that uh, we have to figure out, OK, how do we get the world onto the new version, those sorts of things. And also, we, we've heard from the RxJS team that they have a bunch of really great ideas for the future. And so how do we? balance this idea of taking advantage of the latest and greatest with the, the kind of compatibility that we want to offer to the world. So that that's kind of the fundamental challenge here. All right. Angular language service uses Ivy. So a lot of people don't know this, but under the hood, the Angular language service still uses the old compiler to do template type checking, things like that. And so there is this slim, tiny little uncanny valley where it will infer the wrong thing. Uh, and so we just want to kind of update the language service, make it use the TypeScript or the new NGC compiler so that everything just matches perfectly, uh, which makes Angular better, easier, maintain faster, all those sorts of things. All right. Uh, expand component harnesses best practices. So component harnesses are a really, really important part of Angular that I think a lot of people are ignoring or don't know enough about because we probably haven't talked about them enough. Uh, but it's this idea that when you are testing your application, you should not be forced to test the implementation of components. You shouldn't be having to do HTML selectors and CSS selectors and things like that that rely on how they wrote their templates. So the idea is if component authors are willing to, they should create test harnesses that allow you to abstract away those things. And so we, we've got some tooling around that. Um, but we want to make that better. We want to actually make sure that as more and more people adopt this, it's solving the problem for them. So part of that is just best practices. 
Right. Uh, trusted types is a security uh, feature that's coming to the web or already on the web. And so it's a better way of dealing with certain types of data in JavaScript. And so like HTML and CSS and things like that. And so we were looking at adding support for those uh, so that when you automatically bind to it, like this, this shouldn't be a huge user facing change, but like when you are using the sanitizer and when you are using these things, they'll be trusted types rather than just kind of generic data in JavaScript. Uh, integrate MDC web. I almost want to skip this one because I think we've been talking about this one for a long time. Uh, and you can, if you take a look at the uh, components repo on Angular slash components, you're going to see that we've already shipped a bunch of these at, under the experimental branch. And so this is just an ongoing process that we're kind of just knocking out each component, um, expanding accessibility, aligning with other component libraries that are implementing the material design aesthetic, all those sorts of things. Uh, what else? What else? We only have, let's say we have time for one more. What do we want to talk about? I see one question in the uh, YouTube chat. Can you just call Angular as Angular instead of Angular 8, 9, 10? Yes, I agree. It's, uh, we used to have a hashtag, hashtag, it's just Angular. Most people have gotten the hint. I still see a bunch of threads pop up on Reddit now where they're, they're specifying the version. Angular, uh, an Angular application at version two or four it, it looks just like an Angular application at version 10, right? Like the there's new features like differential loading that's automatic, there's browser lists, there's better configs, all those sorts of things. But this kind of core ideas of templates, dependency injection services, application orchestration, forms, HTTP, all those things are exactly the same. So I, if I ever say Angular 10 when not specifically referring to a feature in a version, please call me out on that because we, we should all just be saying Angular. All right, Sam's one last one last item. What, what do you want to hear about? Oh yes, the strict typing. Uh, strict typing. I think this is one of the most requested feature or library updates. It it is community. Uh, it is it is the number one most reacted to issue on our repo. So Sam uh, Jay was referring to this idea of like the the top issues, the the infamous issues in the repo, uh, and this is number one. And so that that's in order to listen users, that's why it's so high up on our, our roadmap. Many people have been coding around this, eh? so. Yeah, and I mean, like, I, I love the people that are, are coming up with solutions and trying to share them. So, I mean, one of the things that I look at is uh, there was a post on Angular in depth like a month ago about someone who was actually shipped a drop-in replacement for this that added typings. And I'm like, that's so cool. Like, how do we support that person, collaborate with that person so that uh, we can kind of work with the community to solve these problems, which I think is the, the ideal state, so. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we, we only have three minutes left. So I, I wanted to maybe just take a, a minute and say thank you to for having me on this event. Thank you to, to both of the Sams. I, I love every Angular meetup I attend because I always learn something, so. That, that is like this idea of not minifying or not stripping your HTML because some rendering engines don't have support. That, that's, that's such a cool idea. And, and Sam Julian, I, I loved how you laid out the, um, the place of effects because I've never had a really strong mental model for effects in my head. And I think your talk did that. So I, I just thank you to, to everyone on this call and thank you to the community. Oh, thank thanks. you for joining, Steve. <laughs> yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you guys for, for all the interesting talks and for being with us today, spending your time here, uh, supporting the community, uh, Steven, Sams. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I know it's very late for you, Sam. You're still here. That, <laughs> that proves that you're having fun. Yeah, uh, indeed. So, so we're ready for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, to, who joined today. Uh, remember that we're doing this uh, every month. You can find more information about our events in this dot media in Twitter. And if you have any questions, you're going to give a talk or you know someone that can give a talk, reach out to us. We're open for everybody. The idea is to, to hear more fresh faces and new people too. Everyone has the same chance. So, well, I hope to see some of you in a, in a talk in, in the talk in the future. Same as you, Sam, Steven. I hope to see you guys uh, soon in our talk. And well, see you soon in the next sessions. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.